Hello and welcome to today's program titled Recovery Planning and the European Workplace, Some Key Issues. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the text box on your screen. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on the CLE attendance affirmation form. Please write this code down. It will not be reread, and it is required for CLE credit. Copies of their webinar recording and materials will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to your first speaker, is Mr. Pete Telebart. Um, Pete, it's all yours. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, and uh, good afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us uh, today. I'm here with my uh, my colleagues and fellow international employment lawyers, Anna, Sid, Tessa, Cranfield, Lawrence, Harvey, Wood, Martin, Hopkins, and Paul Winder. And today we're going to address some of the issues that we're seeing coming out of uh, recovery planning uh, in uh, European and uh, Middle Eastern jurisdictions. Now, uh, what we've done is we've broken the topic down into the, uh, the subtitles that you now see on the slide. I have to tell you that each of these could in of themselves be a webinar, and we may have to in future go into a little bit more depth on these subjects. We'll talk about that a little bit at the at the end of a of this uh, seminar there's uh, lots of material here and uh, we wanted to give you our uh, perspective as strategic international uh, employment advisors about what we're seeing and uh, also i guess make an obvious point that countries in this crisis are also looking at what other countries are doing so some of the things that we talk about could conceivably wind themselves across the pond into the American legal system where uh, those uh, uh, concepts are consistent with the way that employment law operates in the United States. So now I'll turn it over to my uh, partner, uh, Tessa Cranfield, to uh, discuss some of the issues around managing return to work. Thanks, Pete. Uh, and this is uh, Tessa speaking. So as, as Pete says, we're really uh, thinking big picture and strategic today while trying to give you some, some local flavor and examples. And the biggest strategic issue really, I think, is how do you get some kind of unified and consistent approach um, given that most of those listening, like most of our clients, will operate across multiple countries, often uh, yeah, North America as well as uh, uh, Europe um, and wider EMEA. So uh, what's the best approach? You may have a US playbook. You may be looking to um, apply some standard principles across the board. Is that possible, um, given, as Pete has said, the countries in Europe are going at different uh, speeds? with their return to work. And there are some really surprising differences, given that we're all dealing with the same root cause of this crisis, which is COVID, and the same fundamental scientific um, advice uh, and World Health Organization guidance. So I think a, a key takeaway from this talk will be that there is more difference than you might expect in terms of how countries are tackling this. And we've been spending a, a lot of time recently, including with some of the people on this call, um, helping them uh, work through um, to adapt global policies um, so that they can work in, in multiple different countries. And often we've then had to repeat that exercise uh, when we've got into works council or union negotiations on how those policies work. So some examples, physical distancing, the rules differ surprisingly uh, between you know, one, 1 1.5 meter in a lot of countries, two meters in some other countries, um, Spain, I think still UK. Um, rules around um, uh, testing. Is testing uh, permitted? Um, in a lot of countries, it's still very frowned upon for privacy reasons. A lot of the continental countries like Netherlands and Germany are quite anxious about that, although temperature testing 
people are warming up to. We'll come back to that. In some countries, for larger employers, for instance, testing is mandatory in Russia. So really a, a wide range of difference. Even the rules around when individuals should be quarantining and what the uh, locally recognized uh, symptoms of COVID are uh, from the local health authorities can differ. So how do you manage this and how do you uh, make sure you're being seen to be fair and consistent and that you are reassuring employees who um, maybe not right now, but in the future may go back to working between different locations, um, may be anxious for their safety and um, and wondering whether their home country standards will be maintained. Well, there's no uh, perfect solution to this, I don't think, but um, some of the um, approaches that we're taking include uh, leveling up, so taking a more cautious approach, for instance, in terms of distancing, in terms of encouraging, although you can't always mandate the use of facial coverings in common areas, uh, and in terms of uh, circumstances in which you quarantine, but be aware that can come with a cost because if uh, quarantining, for instance, is not required under local law, uh, you may find that you have to uh, pay at someone's full rate for that. And you may also find that you have quite a debate with works councils um, who uh, have a lot of interest in particular in privacy um, areas and gathering health information. So expect, uh, don't expect to be able to agree these things overnight. And if you're looking to reopen facilities, allow some time for those conversations to take place. Um, and another sort of key tip, I guess, is focusing on the principles. There is some commonality in terms of a messaging around safety first, the importance of training, escalation routes if people do have uh, safety concerns, and internal protocols in the event that you have a confirmed COVID case, for instance. So some, some commonalities there, um, but it's by no means straightforward. And, and 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 what that means is that uh, y if you're looking for a unified recovery plan across multiple jurisdictions, um, that's not going to be possible. That doesn't mean that you can't produce an international recovery plan. It's just not going to be identical in in every jurisdiction. We could we could actually do a seminar on on building these plans. Um, they can be done. You just need to know where the variables are. Now, um, moving on, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the the live issues that uh, our um, multi-jurisdictional uh, based clients are starting to see. Yeah, and it's uh, Anna speaking, Anna Sid. Um, the first thing that we should be taking into account is that Europe has the concept of employees' representatives. Tessa has mentioned a couple of times the Works Council, which is basically a body that is set up in the company to represent the employees. Some, com some countries would have also, along with the employees' representatives or Works Council, uh, union representatives that also have the ability to negotiate on behalf of the employee. Um, they have um, the right to... Um, negotiate and be consulted by the employer or cert on certain topics and importantly on what we're dealing with today uh, on health and safety measures. So um, they also have the right to be consulted in other areas that might be related like uh, mandatory consultation on uh, work suspension, furlough, reduction of working hours, reduction of pay, but we will touch upon this later. Um, what involves health and safety is it's important to take into account that even if the governments have issued guidelines on health and safety measures um, on return to work, and we have seen countries where they have specified how to return to work, how to have the physical separation between employees, the entrance into the workplace to avoid um, accumulation of people um, in closed spaces, um, the specific implementation of those guidelines issued by the government have to be discussed uh, specifically with the employees' representatives. Um, and this leads that it cannot be done just unilaterally by the employer, even again, if the government has issued these guidelines, but you have to sit down with your employees' representatives and negotiate on that. Uh, so, for example, we found that uh, privacy regulators have accepted in some circumstances and under justified reasons uh, to do temperature screening, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the Works Council will have the same view. So you would have to negotiate and at least consult or inform about the measures that you're planning to take. And the same applies to some COVID testing that some companies are, are 
planning or are doing in practice. Um, also, in other countries, like for example in France, health information can only be managed by the health professional, or in Italy, doctors and wards council are required to be involved in any testing or health protocol. So that leads that um, even if there might be a justification from um, guideline um, or even regulator perspective, the the, the specific implementation of any measures will need to be discussed in most European countries with the employees' representatives. And in practice, uh, the requirements of the negotiation and also the requirements on the implementation will, var will vary country by country and also within the country in some regions. So we see in countries like in Italy or in Spain that the specific measures have been applied differently on different phases and different requirements depending on the region you're in, in the different provinces, because they've taken into account the level of infections that they had in that specific region or province. And therefore, um, the, the, the response to the pandemic is different depending on where you are, even in the same country. Which, which means that there is no consistency on the approach that you would want to take, even on the basic protective rules that you would want to apply, apply throughout Europe. Um, and then my colleague Lawrence is going to discuss a little bit more in detail the examples that we can see on this. Thanks, Anna. This is Lawrence speaking. Yeah, so certainly in, in countries like the Netherlands and Germany, where typically you would have a works council of elected employee representatives, they will need to be involved in any new employee checks or data gathering that you might introduce. So not just temperature testing, but even issuing health questionnaires, asking staff whether they've been exposed to COVID or, or had COVID symptoms. So do keep in mind, it's not enough to rely on these steps having been recommended by the local health authorities. You'll also typically need to speak to your local health and safety committees where, where these exist in relation to COVID safety measures um, affecting the workplace. So that might involve closing common areas, physical separation measures and, and flexible working hours. You'll find different local rules across Europe on the use of face masks. And that may be because even the scientists don't really agree on how effective they are. And initially European authorities tended to discourage generalized use of masks as, in, as being ineffective, but many have now reversed their position. With that said, they're not mandatory under all local laws by any means, and that in itself raises legal issues. For example, do you have to supply masks to staff, and is it possible, is it permissible to make wearing masks obligatory? If you do want to do so, then that is most likely to be a consultation issue with the relevant Works Council Health and Safety Committee. One of the things that we've been struggling the most with as um, you know in our capacity as multi-jurisdictional advisors is that a lot of the laws that have been slammed into place across Europe have been done so over periods of you know say two weeks and they normally take two years to to you know be properly uh, implemented. And what's that? What that has meant is that they sit on top of the underlying legal system. Uh, so a lot of what we're looking at is squaring away these emergency laws with you know underlying rights that haven't gone away. And one of the most important of those, in addition to that which um, uh, Anna and Lawrence have been talking about is data protection. You all know, I hope, that uh, in Europe, employees have considerable uh, protection in relation in particular to their, their, their personal data. And, uh, you know, and, and if I, Pete, am your employee in Europe, suddenly you're very interested in my temperature every day. Uh, you're interested in my personal travel. Uh, where I've gone on vacation, maybe you're interested in my wife's health and, and my children's health, and you want to know all about that in order to make your workplace safe. Well, you're creating a pool of intensely personal data about me that is very highly protected under European law. So you really uh, need to think about that as you determine your safety measures
um, you're you're gathering stuff about me that I'm going to be very angry about if it gets into the uh, into the hands of a, of a third party. Now, um, Anna has also mentioned the collective consultation obligations in Europe. We have very high levels of industrial democracy that, you know, typically for the Americans on this call, you're not used to seeing. Um, don't forget that in addition to collective consultation uh, obligations, you're also uh, in most European jurisdictions going to have individual consultation obligations as well. We don't want to lose sight of health and safety, and we're going to look at that um, uh, separately. Tess is going to speak about that in, in a few minutes. Um, but um, there are, you know, obviously some examples uh, in relation to health and safety that you you really need to be considering. Yeah, that's right, Pete. Um, uh, and, and as Pete has said, so you, the starting point uh, in in companies in a country another size where they have uh, works councils, the starting point will be there. And with some of those topics that require works council approval, I'm thinking, for instance, of changing people's hours, of significant changes to privacy, arrangements and gathering data. If you have the Works Council's agreement, that may be enough. You may not then need to go out individually one-to-one. -one. But even in those companies, um, there will be a lot of issues that still uh, need to be discussed at an individual level. And in other countries like the UK, this is very largely um, an individual uh, process. Even if you're taking a consistent approach, communicating across the board, there will be individual cases and individual discussions needed. So uh, an example of that is health and safety, for instance, where uh, in a number of countries, and certainly in the UK, you're required to have um, a general health and safety risk assessment and then act on the results of that um, to um, address um, any safety issues that you find in terms of uh, organization of work, um, equipment, and the rest of it. But that's not the end of the story. Um, because some employees will be in um, higher risk categories, and, and Paul will look at this with the UK as an example um, in a moment. Um, what that will lead into, though, is then a much more bespoke conversation um, with those people, even if you have a general system in place as to how you address risks. You can expect that that will not be totally the end of the story. Um, and we shouldn't forget that there are also high risk groups in terms of, for instance, employees with childcare. Um, in a lot of countries, schools are still closed, nurseries are closed, and um, childcare is limited, uh, and people have other caring responsibilities, in particular uh, if people close to them are um, in a vulnerable category. So that can lead into other rights and protections, which, uh, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail. But clearly, as an employer, whether or not someone can sue you for this, you want to be factoring this into your planning. Um, and anticipating to, to avoid these kind of problems coming up. Uh, you may not know, for instance, how far people live from uh, their workplace and how they come into work. So these are early conversations to be having um, with a view to avoiding not only legal issues, actually, but also continuity issues uh, where you really need people to be effectively working as business um, ramps back up. Uh, to some extent, ignorance can be bliss if you don't know about uh, you know, the fact someone uh, lives with a vulnerable person in their household, but by this stage, probably most employers are on notice of those kind of situations, um, and so we there's a potential liability if we don't factor those in. The other point uh, we wanted to flag on this slide, um, if as you make your return to work plans, uh, you realise that there will be changes to individual working arrangements, for instance, uh, there's a lot of government recommendation about staggering work times, about cohorting people. Um, so putting people onto shift patterns in facilities, um, perhaps adjusting people's duties if it's not safe for them uh, to be in their previous, say, frontline role because they have a health condition. Um, in that kind of situation, you are likely to need um, individual agreement, and how you go about that will differ very much from country to country. Some countries like the UK, we may be more relaxed if, uh, if you've got some flexibility in contracts. Uh, we may be able to... Uh, rely on a notification, but in a lot of countries, and, and, it, and in some cases too in the UK, that's, that won't be safe. And um, there's a surprising level of formality in some countries, even uh, 
where you're making a, quite a minor change, sometimes that needs to be formalized, even as a contract variation. So worth planning ahead for that um, because um, it can take a little time and the risk can be um, significant. Lawrence. Thanks, Tessa. Yeah, and that is especially important in civil law jurisdictions across Europe. Obtaining a express consent from employees to changes in their work arrangements is usually going to be required rather than just giving a unilateral notice to them. But there are exceptions to that, such as coming out of furlough arrangements. And I think that brings us on to our next topic, um, for which I hand over to Paul. Thanks, Lawrence. Yeah, I'm going to be um, just talking about some considerations to bear in mind when ending furlough or short-term work arrangements. Um, generally, there'll be an obligation to notify rather than obtain agreement when you want to bring these arrangements to an end. But you should check any relevant provisions in the agreements that have been entered into with the employee individually or the employee representative body, for example, any works council. Um, in countries like Germany and Switzerland, the works council agreement and state subsidy applications have a fixed end date, but the arrangements can be brought to an end sooner. And the state subsidy can also end automatically if the conditions which triggered the entitlement no longer apply. So, for example, if customer orders revive. Generally, employers um, have to apply the same working time reduction to all staff within a given site or team, which is, um, for example, the case in France. Or at least um, you have to achieve a total average reduction for the month in order to qualify for the relevant state subsidies. And for example, that's the position in Germany and in the Netherlands. This means that you'll need to give careful um, planning to ensure that the business needs are properly met and that the arrangements themselves are workable. You'll need to be conscious of the fact that vacation entitlements may have been postponed during short time work arrangement periods, uh, and or there may have been a reduction in the rate of pay for vacation so there may be balances to use up. In certain countries, um, furlough schemes are being adapted as lockdown is lifted. And as Tessa alluded to, in the UK, for example, uh, there are changes afoot. Um, no new entrance to the fur furlough scheme will be accepted after 30th of June. And that means that an employee must have been furloughed for the first time today, 10th June, in order that they will meet the minimum requirements of three weeks of furlough before the 30th. Further, um, from 1st July, furloughed employees in the UK will be allowed to undertake part-time work and be furloughed under the scheme for the remainder of their working time. We don't have much detail on this at the moment, but further guidance is expected from this Friday, June 12th. Just as a final point on this, and more generally, consideration needs to be given um, as to whether any changes to terms relating to hours, start and finish times, job roles are required from a purely commercial perspective as well as being driven um, by the outcome of risk assessments related to health and safety. And consideration will need to be given to whether such changes will be temporary or permanent, and most importantly of all, how they will be rolled out to employees. And it's just worth reiterating uh, some of the points that have been made earlier that agreement will be required to make the change. It's highly unlikely that you'll be able to impose changes unilaterally. There's also likely to be consultation requirements that apply prior to seeking employee agreement. And finally, just to bear in mind that even the best laid plans may need to be adapted to uh, cope with the particular circumstances of certain employees. Yeah, and if we look around Europe, we will find also higher levels of inconsistency uh, where the rules are being applied. And not only inconsistency, but unfortunately also some confusion that has been um, taking place in some countries like um, Spain, for example, where after declaring the partial reopening of some activities and some industries that have been closed by the government mandate as a result of the pandemic, um, it wasn't clear how this partial reopening 
uh, was going to be implemented or aligned with the government subsidies that had been granted. So to give you an example, for instance, restaurants were allowed to open at a 30% capacity and uh, the remainder of the employees who wouldn't return to work because only 30% 30, 30 of the workforce was allowed to get back, um, it wasn't clarified by the guidance or the government regulations uh, how these subsidies will be kept for those employees who wouldn't return to work or if the employer was allowed to keep the subsidies at all or they would have to just return them when they were partially reopening. Thankfully, this has been clarified uh, with a proportional decrease of the subsidies, but we found that this confusion is not unique to Spain. In some other countries, we have seen that. And not surprisingly, this has also affected um, other regions in the world, like Latin America countries, where there was a certain level of confusion in terms of the obligations to keep on paying the salaries for the employees that had been suspended without work uh, because of the mandatory closures like in Mexico, or government aids that would be required um, as a result of, of the mandatory closures. Um, we will continue to face this because, as Pete has referenced, these are regulations that are being approved by governments on the go. And then basically that means that in practice we will find practical implement difficulties on um, the implementation of such measures that need to be further clarified by the regulators. And um, Tessa is going to guide us through some special cases that we need to watch out for. Yeah, and picking up on what Anna's just said, employers really are in quite an unenviable situation. So not only are there somewhat different measures between countries and to some extent between workplaces, um, the UK, for instance, has a, a set of, um, I think it's eight different, uh, lots of guidance, uh, depending on what type of workplace it is. But also, as Anna says, we have a, a changing situation. Um, and I think we're all very mindful that even if uh, cases now are dropping and we're moving towards a return to normality, um, we need to be prepared for the fact there could be a, a second wave. Um, and that needs to be factored into plans. So with that in mind, uh, yeah, particular scenario to, to look out for this is the first we've flagged on the slide. How can you be confident that you've taken all steps um, to protect uh, employees' health and safety? Um, in fact, this is a bit of a red herring. I think uh, most companies and even um, health authorities would say it's probably impossible to be 100% certain um, that there is no risk of exposure at all. So what you're really doing is, is making sure that you have followed the processes, the thought processes, the planning, you have the documents in place uh, to show you've been through this, that you are minimizing the risk as far as possible. Um, but can you ever be in a position where you feel so confident that if an employee says they don't feel comfortable returning to work, you feel you can treat that as a disciplinary case or even terminate? It's certainly not impossible that if someone refuses to come to work, that could be treated as a disciplinary case or pay withheld. But to do that, you'd need to be very confident um, that you have done absolutely everything you need to from a health and safety point of view, um, as well as, of course, looking at local rules around whether there are other options for them. And to Paul's point, for instance, in the UK, provided you've done it by today, there's a suggestion that you could furlough which means putting on a, a leave with a heavy government subsidy, um, employees who, who really shouldn't be coming into work, um, and you can do that until October. So you'd need to make sure you've looked at those options by country. If you haven't uh, taken the kind of reasonable steps needed from a safety point of view, um, and then you plan to either dock pay or, or even discipline someone who won't come into work, there are some quite significant consequences of getting that wrong. Um, and we probably won't get uh, really clear guidance until litigation starts to go through the courts as to what is reasonable here. Uh, from a UK point of view, you'd be looking at what the employee reasonably thought the situation was, what the medical situation was at the time, which might include the infection rate very locally to the workplace, for instance, and of course, what, what steps were actually taken. Um, so I think the key will be um, to investigate someone's circumstances uh, where they do refuse to come in, um, to the extent you haven't already flushed that out with your um, communications and discussion before bringing people back in. Also be aware, of course, um, that we're not just talking about individual issues like constructive dismissal, where someone can resign and, and claim 
uh, severance compensation, for instance. We're also looking at potentially um, health and safety inspections by um, the local authorities. Um, and in a lot of countries, that involves a potential personal liability for senior managers, which is something that always worries us, especially in these times when no one is quite sure how far their insurance policies extend um, to cover issues relating to COVID. And how about employees who commute to work on public transport? A lot of, in a lot of countries, governments are warning people against uh, using public transport if they can avoid it. Um, how far is that the employer's problem? We normally wouldn't get into that issue unless the employer is itself providing, for instance, shuttle buses. Um, but we are seeing, and, and looking across uh, the Atlantic as well, that uh, some companies are saying where we have previously encouraged uh, carpools, we're now discouraging that. Um, and where you're having to travel uh, on business during the day, we will pay for um, a single um, taxi. So, so you're the only occupant. Um, so for the moment, again, until we have um, some litigation running through and some clearer guidance on that, it's a potential issue, I think, in the UK. But we can perhaps be a bit more robust on that um, in some of the other European countries. Um, home working generally still is the default. Um, so even if someone works in, a, in an essential industry, uh, generally you will need to justify them coming into the workplace until we get to the next phases of um, the return to work. And some of you may, may be familiar with the fact that uh, employees in some countries have had to produce passes, uh, digital passes in some countries like, like Russia, in order to be, um, yeah, in case they're challenged um, uh, yeah, when, when they leave the house to, to come to work. Um, so that's, that's phasing out, but it's still an issue in a number of countries. And taking that a step further, uh, we are starting to deal with the sort of first questions around managing employees who normally would travel for business. And in fact, that can be quite fundamental to their role. A lot of uh, governments, including the UK, are still advising that people should undertake essential travel only. Um, some countries uh, are keeping this under review. They have a finite period after which travel is clearly opening up. Others like the UK still have almost an indefinite discouragement of travel. It's not necessarily a ban. But um, if you're thinking about travel, um, you need to get into a lot of detail about um, both the, uh, the home location employees traveling from and their destination, because there are quarantine requirements in a lot of countries that um, either restrict what people can do when they get there or will be a significant burden for People, when they come back, for instance, the UK, um, there's a 14-day quarantine on returning to the UK from abroad, and I believe it's a criminal offence to even leave the house. Is it reasonable to ask employees to do that, uh, even if they can work from home? Is it reasonable that you should restrict their activities in that way? And that certainly will be um, a Works Council issue and, a, and a potentially a privacy infringement if you're asking people about their personal travel um, in a lot of countries, um, like, for instance, the Netherlands um, and France. Now, in terms of other uh, higher risk cases to look out for, I will pass on to Paul. Thanks, Tessa. And you know, just firstly to build on that point in respect of quarantine, obviously that has relevance to um, the points that I was making about bringing uh, sh uh, employees out of furlough, um, because what we've seen uh, in that situation uh, where employees have been furloughed is that they have um, relocated to another country during the lockdown. And now, obviously, they are, in a lot of circumstances, going to be uh, required to return back to the country where they work. And even when there are no uh, quarantine issues, there may be other considerations in these circumstances, such as the availability of flights, their cost, the availability of accommodation for work travel, and so on. And you know, just to make that point again, in order to act reasonably, which is such a key concept in all of the European jurisdictions, plans may need to be adapted um, for uh, a particular employees to cater for their individual circumstances. There may be employees who still have a right to work remotely or be furloughed. For example, in the UK, most vulnerable employees should stay at home, which is referred to as shielding, even if they want to return. I mean, that's those employees with cancer, severe respiratory conditions and the like. Another example is pregnant employees have a right to suspension on full pay if they are at real risk. Uh, 
as mentioned earlier, if employees are vulnerable, then employers should consider their position very carefully before requiring them to come into work, given the potential legal risks of doing so. So those risks include constructive dismissal, but also personal injury claims. And perhaps most significantly, uh, the area to consider is in, in the arena of discrimination. The risk of disability discrimination is the obvious one, but there's emerging evidence that other groups may be dis disproportionately affected by the um, virus. For example, Public Health England has published a report stating that people with a Bangladeshi ethnic background had around twice the risk of death from COVID than white British people. People of Chinese, Indian, Pakistani, other Asian, Caribbean, and other black ethnic backgrounds had between 10% and 50% higher risk of death compared to white British people. So you'll need to be mindful of the output of any similar statistical analysis in other countries since a failure to take appropriate steps to protect employees at higher risk on grounds of ethnicity could amount to indirect race discrimination, which just as a reminder, broadly speaking, is a protection that arises when a rule is applied to everyone, but which places a particular group at a disadvantage. In such case, the employer would likely need to show that either it took steps to significantly reduce the risk of contracting the virus, such that the disadvantage was removed, or that the requirement to attend work under current conditions is justified as a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. Likely to be possible to show a legitimate aim, but whether the requirement is pr proportionate may depend upon whether there are alternative measures available. Yeah, and in this regard, we have to also be aware that some of the countries have even applied a limitation on dismissals or restructuring as a consequence of COVID-19. Countries like Italy or Spain, and also you know, the regions of the world like Latin America, have issued regulations that basically said that it is not possible uh, to uh, implement dismissals or restructuring in the context of the pandemic. Uh, without leaving aside the already existing protections in those countries and some other European countries that some groups of employees have, including sickly, sickness, uh, maternity, paternity, or some other um, groups that have already a protection involved in that termination could trigger even the obligation to reinstate the employee. There have been some regulations that basically declare the termination is not valid. And um, these limitations are often related or to the fact that the employer has taken state subsidies. For example, in the Netherlands, there has been a requirement, there has been approved a requirement to pay back uh, a fine reflecting the portion of the subsidy that has been received in case a termination uh, during the subsidy period take place. And similarly to these, Poland has ruled that uh, within a fixed period after receiving the subsidy, there's a limitation for terminations. So I guess the, the rationale behind this is that governments are subsidizing, uh, providing subsidies to the companies to allow them uh, um, overcome or stay within this uh, pandemic situation. And in return, companies have to be committed not to implement the terminations as, as, re as a result of this of these grounds. So that is something that we have to take into account, uh, looking to the future and possible restructuring measures that companies will, um, in many cases, will have to face. Thanks, Anna. We're moving on now to talk about uh, how you manage employees who refuse to return to work. This, of course, is, is a potential issue everywhere. There's a lot of variation in the way local rules on health and safety and disciplinary action actually play out. In continental Europe, generally, priority, of course, is to make arrangements so that staff can work from home wherever that's possible. And failing that, then to put in place flexible work arrangements in terms of hours, to put in place physical dist distancing measures and, and, and the like in order to minimize risk to the extent reasonably possible. But if you do have an employee who nevertheless refuses to return to work to perform activities for which he or she genuinely needs to be on site, uh, 
typically you should then be able to suspend pay and you should also be able to take disciplinary action if necessary. Now, in civil law countries, generally it's advisable to investigate the reasons for the refusal to return to work before actually launching disciplinary action. But you do need to keep in mind that in some continental Europe countries, there are statutory time limits for launching disciplinary action. So in France, for example, you have to start the formal proceedings within two months. And uh, I think there are similar rules in, in Spain and indeed in Belgium. Um, Tessa, handing over to you for comment on the UK. Yes, so uh, in the UK, at the risk of repeating myself, it, it clearly is worth having a dialogue with, with people up front. And indeed, in terms of health and safety risk assessments and planning, um, you are supposed to consult with um, employees on those, um, which clearly is a bit trickier if you don't have a, a committee or a representative set up for that, as you might in a country like France. Um, in fact, you're required to. Um, so having that dialogue early will um, help to avoid some of these issues. But uh, we talked about the risks if you do go into docking pay or issuing warnings, when in fact an employee can say it was not reasonable for them to return, or as Paul was highlighting, that there's a potential discrimination issue there. For instance, they have an underlying condition, which means they're more at risk, which qualifies uh, as a disability, which uh, it's, it's quite likely to um, if it has made them um, more at risk of, of COVID. It's quite a, a low bar for the UK. Um, the other point, uh, and lifting our eyes from, from the UK and, and a bit more broadly, is that you should be aware that there are various um, state leaves and, and payments um, available for employees who, uh, for instance, have someone in their household who's at higher risk. Uh, I think that's the case in, in France, for instance. There are special uh, carers leaves available. So um, it's definitely worth exploring all of those. And, and they're very much local specific. Um, and offering those as alternatives, failing that even potentially unpaid leave um, before you take any more drastic action. Um, and that will definitely be one to, um, to dig into uh, and check the local specific rules. Um, this is a good moment before I uh, pass on to Pete to share with you some of our thoughts about um, what, what this all means and, and where things are heading. Uh, for me to give you the CLE code, for those of you uh, in the US who want to claim that, and that code is SS, so CIFAS Shaw 6565, that's SS6565. Um, and I'll now hand on to Pete, who's gonna share with you some of our um, tactical thoughts of, about where this is going and what legal and HR hmm. can be planning for and, uh, and um, thinking about looking around the bend. Thanks, uh, thanks, Tessa. Well, well, look, as I said, I, as I said at, at the start of this, you know, so much of uh, of what uh, what we've seen the employment law landscape has changed in in such a hard time. Uh, we have some variables that are caused by COVID nineteen. You know, in 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 jurisdictions like the UAE, where the economy is dependent upon uh, expat workers, they've all fled. Uh, so, so what are the implications for working in the UAE? How are those people going to get back? How does immigration law link in with uh, with um, uh, COVID nineteen tests? You know, those are some of the things that we have to think about. Uh, both Tessa and Paul have have talked about reasonableness um, in particular. We'll be interested to see how judges react to all of this. Uh, remember that we said that a lot of these laws have been executed in weeks, uh, a process that uh, normally takes years, and they haven't had time to connect all the dots. So are the judiciary in European jurisdictions going to be forgiving, or are they going to hold us to the, to the letter of the law? Um, are we going to see waves of employment-related litigation? We hope not, but that's going to depend very much on the um, the attitude of the judiciary. What we know we're going to see, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll sort of set out in a, in a, in a few comments. Um, the rise and rise of remote working. Now, there was already a wave towards uh, remote working. Uh, we could talk about this for a long time, and maybe we will with some of you if you want us to, but uh, remote working has taken a huge leap, and it's probably here to stay. 
the work play the workforce is full of people who didn't think they could do their jobs uh, remotely they've proved that they can how does an employer reasonably say um uh, you're no longer uh, uh, able to do your work from home. Interesting one. Um, contracts of employment. I mean, personally, I don't think I will ever draft another employment contract that doesn't have a layoff or short time clause. You know, in, in uh, jurisdictions where employees have contracts of employment and you're telling them to work less hours or work from home or earn less, you have to get their agreement to it. Um, even where you have a clause that says we can unilaterally reduce your pay in certain circumstances, if this thing or this sort of thing happens again, we will have to consider um, maybe changing contracts of employment uh, and employee rules in advance. So that's, that's something we all have to think about. Um, Lawrence and Anna in particular have talked about uh, works councils and uh, European industrial democracy. You know, um, the countries that have done well out of this are the ones that have been able to lock down quickly. So our employer is going to have to start thinking about getting advance permission from their, their, uh, their social partners, the works councils, the employee representatives to um, trigger certain changes rapidly if we get uh, another pandemic or, or another wave of, of COVID-19. So start looking at your entire suite of employment documents. Think about the things we've all had to do together in this emergency crash dive. Assume that we might have to do them again and think about how we could make that easier. Um, we've talked about potential changes to shift patterns as we have requirements for social distancing in workplaces. If an employer can only have, say, a third to a half of the people uh, in, the, uh, in the workplace, would they perhaps run two shifts to keep their productivity to similar levels? Um, uh, what does that mean for the employment documents? A lot of jurisdictions have uh, legal regimes that apply specifically to night workers. Um, temperature testing, uh, you know, how are we going to do that? We've talked about data protection, about uh, uh, employees' temperatures. Uh, are we going to have to keep permanent measures in place that we can reactivate uh, if it becomes uh, necessary? What about newly symptomatic employees? Uh, should they have... Um, uh, specific protocols put in place? Should they have uh, separate notification requirements? What do we do for people who don't know if they're sick, um, st you know, start to experience systems at the workplace? Do we have a protocol for that? And then consider in, in Europe the raft of employment policies that we tend to have. A lot of countries have grievance or whistleblowing procedures? Well, um, typically those procedures require employers to give somebody um, a fair hearing and a right of appeal. So if employees want to raise COVID-related concerns, either I don't want to come back and I'm grieving it, or I don't think you're being safe enough and I'm grieving that, are we not better off having a separate, more streamlined policy rather than giving those employees no alternative but to uh, take their complaints through um, legally required grievance or whistleblowing procedures? What about returning employees who've tested positive for um, COVID-19 or um, may have been exposed and we don't know if they're immune? We need to think about that. Um, we've all heard about notions of quarantine that countries are starting to require, particularly when people are entering the jurisdiction from, from another one. Well, what is the legal status of quarantine time? Is that sick time? Is it leave? Is it leave without pay? You know, how are we going to categorize um, quarantine periods? Um, Paul, in particular, talked about the, um, the medical evidence that's starting to come out in relation to specific groups being at higher risk. So 
Um, and bear in mind that existing discrimination laws still continue to uh, to apply, and in particular, the idea of uh, indirect discrimination, as we call it, or disparate impact, as it's known in the United States. What are the best practices for selecting employees to uh, return to work? Um, what legal issues do we need to consider in each of the various jurisdictions? What about things like child care, uh, senior care, especially for vulnerable seniors, transportation and, and other issues? Uh, you know, Tessa referred to the issue of transportation. Our problem is it's easier to make the workplaces safe than it is in the big cities to make the journey to work safe. So we all have to have a a, um, a a chat about that. Return to work questionnaires. Well, um, if someone has been sick and they want to come back into the workplace, uh, how do we assess the risk of doing that, and how do we actually integrate them back into the um, into the workplace? And and on that note, uh, return to work instructions. Do we? Um, do we put particular people under a, a different social distancing regime? Um, the answers to all these questions are in a, in a state of evolution at present, but it's important that we all start thinking now about how we're going to handle the, the practical um, impact of, uh, of this pandemic and how it's changed all of our lives in the workplace going forward. I'll turn over to... Anna to talk about some, uh, some summary comments and some things that we may do going forward. Thanks, Pete. Um, so yes, I, in fact, we are in a real time of change, and we are already thinking on what's coming next, as you can, as you can tell from Pete's explanations, and how we can support our clients in the best way in this challenging times. So my colleague Martin Hopkins is going to explain a little bit a couple of interesting initiatives that we're going through and that we're working on for future seminars like this one. Thank you very much indeed, Anna. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning to everybody. Um, yes, we're continuing to kind of work out as we go what we can do to best support our clients and our contacts effectively during these crazy times. Um, one of the ideas that we're kicking around at the moment is that in addition to this kind of large group webinar, we might set up a series of small group, maybe eight to ten people only, virtual roundtables. Uh, in contrast to the webinars, these would be set up in such a way uh, as to enable sharing of experiences and best practice as, as between the delegates, and that would probably be the focus of the event rather than uh, us providing information to you. Uh, and that would also enable us to focus on single, narrow issues uh, so that we could dive deeper into the practicalities of the challenges that everybody's actually facing. Uh, at the moment, that's just an idea that we're uh, we're um, thinking through. But what we've done is we've thrown up on the screen some of the possible subjects that we are currently thinking about. Um, if you'd like to hear more about this as our plans develop, um, and if you'd like to think about participating in any one or more of those, then please um, either let Megan uh, Green know. Megan will have emailed all of you yesterday or if it's easiest, simply get in touch with your usual uh, CIFAF contact and we'll make sure to gather that information all together. Uh, as I say, this is just an idea at the moment, but this uh, seemed like a great opportunity to get some uh, real-time input from you guys as to what might be most helpful to you. Uh, so we've got just a few minutes left uh, and we do have a number of questions. We won't actually have time to cover all of them um, in the six minutes that remain, but I think we'll probably be able to do a couple. Um, and the first one um, is a fairly simple, straightforward question, which is how does all of this uh, link in with GDPR compliance? Um, and I was going to ask Tessa if you'd be kind enough to pick this one up for us. Yes, thanks for giving me the easy one, Martha. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, uh, 
it's clearly at the forefront. I think the interesting thing is that those of you, and clearly a lot of you are on the call, pretty expert and know your way around GDPR, supposed to um, set a, a kind of consistent standard um, across Europe, including the UK, even though the uh, UK is leaving EU at the end of the year, um, and includes principles uh, that would allow you potentially to collect and, and, and handle data. Um, to help with the health and safety issues we've talked about, uh, safeguarding health is, is a potential legitimate um, uh, reason for collecting data. But, of course, then there's an interpretation as to how far do you have to go in collecting data. Interesting that we've seen quite a bit of a shift in the local regulators' attitude to this. And a number of regulators started off, I'm thinking in particular of the Dutch, saying um, it was not... Um, justified to, to collect temperature or even to check people's temperatures. People should do it at home before they came in. There was uncertainty in the UK too, in Germany. Um, in fact, a lot of those rules have now um, either explicitly been relaxed in Germany state by state, but there's now a sort of federal um, kind of direction on that in terms of uh, uh, encouraging actually sort of temperature testing. Um, but um, it should still be handled as always in, in line with privacy principles. So try not to collect the data. You know, think about how else can you do it? Can you trust employees to do it themselves before they come in? If they do it on arrival, for instance, do you need to collect the data at all? Or do you do a check and the data is then deleted? And then you can extend those principles in terms of health questionnaires, asking people about personal travel, um, COVID testing, which is still, I think, a bit of an outlier in Europe. So the principles are there. The interpretation locally um, has moved along a bit. But there are still some concerns, um, as the questioner rightly raises, um, about uh, you know, whether it's justified in each location. Hope that helps, Martin. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Tessa. And we've got time for one more. Um, we do have more questions that have been submitted. Um, if your question hasn't been answered, don't worry. Um, we'll answer all of them offline uh, and by email. So um, if you don't get covered now, don't worry. We'll pick up with you later on. So this last question, which Paul has kindly agreed to run with for us, uh, is what would happen if someone gets signed off sick with stress as they feel uncomfortable to return after working for a period of time at home, despite significant efforts in relation to risk assessment, social distancing, etc.? Can we suspend sick pay? Paul, over to you. Thanks, Martin. Um, I think the, the quick answer on that is is it's highly unlikely that you would be able to, um, particularly if there is a, a medical sign-off for stress. It is notoriously difficult in all jurisdictions to try and prove that an individual is not genuinely suffering from a, a condition which makes it incapable of them returning to work, even if you have taken all the steps you feel are reasonable to enable them to do so. So I think that you'd still have to pay, uh, but you could obviously begin a capability process, which could, at the extreme end, result in termination. The other point that you'll probably need to deal with along the, on the, along the way is whether the employee makes a flexible working request, um, arguing that they were able to work at home perfectly well beforehand. So why are they being required to come into work now? Surely the arrangement that was in temporarily in place can be made permanent. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Paul. I'm just going to throw it across to Anna, but just before I do that, uh, we have had one more question that I will actually answer in real time now. That question is, I didn't hear the CLE code. So just one last time, that CLE code is S for Sierra, S for Sierra, 6565. Five. So Sierra, Sierra, 6565. Five. Anna, over to you. Okay, thank you, Martin. So with this, we conclude our content for today. Thank you very much for joining. We hope you have enjoyed the session and found it useful. And we will, of course, be happy to support in any help is needed and look forward to hearing from you in the next seminar, if not before. Thank you very much. Hi, this concludes today's webinar. Everyone, thank you for attending. Have a very good day.